Welcome to uh, this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Canada's own energy regulator says that oil output in the year 2050, the net zero target year, will be 4.8 million barrels a day versus the 5 million barrels a day produced in 2021. So it's pretty clear that 85% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels and probably will for a while. So today on the program, state of play in the energy sector. And with us is Lisa Baton. She is the president and CEO of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, first woman to fill the job. She's from Saskatchewan, so that makes her special already. Uh, she was also the managing director at uh, Canada Pension Plan Investments, and she was at Envi Environics Research in the Canadian Bankers Association. So lots of experience dealing with uh, big industries. Welcome, Lisa. Very, very nice to meet you. Well, thank you for having me, Pamela. I'm delighted so, to be here, and, uh, and uh, particularly as a, a fellow Saskatchewan. That's right. This is all very important to us. We tend to, when we're talking about energy, think Alberta, but it's uh, just as an important part of our lifeblood in Saskatchewan as well. You you wrote a, an op-ed in a in the Regina Post. Uh, you know, I think it was last summer. But let me just reprise it here. Fundamental economics, namely supply and demand, have caused the current global energy shortfall. A near decade-long industry downturn saw investment leave the traditional sector. Then the pandemic restrictions were lifted and there was a historic rebound. I'm just condensing in here. Uh, and then this is combined with the challenges of scaling up to wind and solar and other renewables, which are still unpredictable. The result, rising prices, energy scarcity, and countries reverting to coal to meet their citizens' energy needs. Where are we? Still there, right in that spot? Um. I think that there has been um, an increasing awareness uh, on the need for pragmatism uh, in terms of aligning um, policy across environmental, uh, energy security, and uh, economic goals. Um, you know, global global demand for energy is is at pre-pandemic levels, and it's growing. If you look at uh, all credible forecasts, you know, uh, demand for uh, oil and gas is is going to continue uh, uh, probably to 2050 uh, and beyond. Yeah, um, yeah. And it just it just shows that the world is going to need more forms of all energy, and uh, particularly as nations look to re uh, replace energy provided by less secure regimes uh, with supply from safe and uh, trusted producers, um, you know, which is an opportunity for Canada as uh, a producer of some of the most responsibly produced energy in the world. Okay, just let me, because that's a phrase that's used all the time, and I want to make sure we're we're dealing with fact here. Do we indeed produce the cleanest energy in the world? I mean, nobody really thinks they want to get it from Nigeria or Saudi Arabia or, you know, uh, other sources. Uh, are, are we really? The cleanest? Well, certainly, uh, we have uh, we, we we're a democrat. We're, we're one of the fourth. We're the fourth largest uh, reserve in the world. Uh, we are a democratic nation. We have um, uh, uh, human rights and uh, labor standards. And uh, yes, uh, uh, the upstream industry is is uh, among among the global thought leaders. Um, uh, 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 innovating and uh, using technology to to uh, uh, continue to um, make our product even more responsibly produced and and um, and, and to clean and, up and, uh, yes. you know we want to be <laughs> the the last barrel standing. Um, yeah. But we're doing a good job of the cleanup as well. Uh, the out, you know, the 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 downside of of oil sands. It, you know, we have found cleaner ways to put this out and and clean up what's left. Well, you know, you know, you you mentioned uh, oil sands. You know, I think 
Um, the upstream sector and the oil sands have made CCUS or carbon capture uh, and storage a really important part of uh, its decarbonization plans. And combined with other industries such as utilities, we, we really want to leverage uh, those kind of clean technologies, uh, CCUS, CO2 sequestration, direct or capture, and we want that to grow exponentially in Canada. Uh, but we need the right public policies and investments to do that. You know, I was in Sarah Week last week <clears throat> when uh, U.S. Secretary Granholm uh, spoke, and uh, I can say that it was just an absolute mic drop moment. The U.S. has clearly signaled that climate change is also economic security policy, and they've opted for uh, market incentives uh, for investment uh, in clean tech solutions. And if you look at the U.S. IRA, um, you know, they're seeking to align their climate policy with industrial policy, and they've sent a very clear message that they want to want the big decarbonization projects like carbon capture to be built in the U.S. and and um, and Canada. Uh, well, uh, the U.S. IRA and then the announcement, uh, the additional announcement uh, Secretary Granholm made last week of an additional sixty two billion dollar uplift fund to partner with the private sector on those uh, decarbonization, clean uh, technologies and projects uh, really has had every uh, country around the world paying attention uh, and uh, on the need to be competitive for that capital. All right, I, I wanna get into that because the this investment question is really, really por important given the US Infrastructure Act and that money, but just a little diversion. Uh, as we were about to have this conversation this week, uh, President Biden announces the Willow Pipeline in, in Alaska, and having said no quite dramatically 15 seconds into office to Keystone, what do you think that signals? I think that <clears throat> attitudes are shifting. Um, not just with in the U.S., but also in Canada, you know, very, you know, clearly we have to tackle uh, climate change. It's a global problem. And um, but we have to look at the entire denominator, not just our own numerator. And I think that uh, governments globally, particularly post Russia and Ukraine, have realized the interconnectivity of uh, uh, all of these policies, and uh, and the and the need for a more pragmatic alignment uh, across um, uh, environment, energy security, and and economic policy. And I think you know you referenced Willow, and you referenced uh, you know I, I referenced uh, uh, U.S. Secretary of Energy Granholm's speech yep. last week, and you know they have really indicated that they're very serious about decarbonizing. They are not stepping back from that, but they've also uh, indicated that, you know, they need reliable uh, energy and uh, domestic energy security is a priority. North American energy security is a problem. And, you know, if I can quote uh, Granholm, she said, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So, you know, from, from, my perspective, uh, she's right. These two goals are not, let me re repeat, they are not in conflict with each other and they're not mutually exclusive. They're in fact, you know, fully integrated. You know, the, the world does need oil and natural gas and the world also needs to decarbonize and, and we can do both. So when we hear this, you know, and watch this, uh, as you say, more pragmatic approach, it seems that we're kind of stuck politically, though, because so many of our leaders went out way out on the green branch and said, you know, oil and gas is bad and we're going to have the green world and it's all going to be, uh, you know, batteries and hydrogen power and all of these things. But they kind of got ahead of themselves in the game because we're not we're not there yet, as those numbers right at, at the beginning of our discussion attest that we're going to be, you know, putting out as much oil uh, in 2050 as we are now, because you can't compensate for it all with wind and solar. So did they get ahead of their skis in a sense? Um, I think that there was perhaps a, uh, uh, a confluence of a few things. You know, one, um, the conflation of 
fossil fuels uh, as as bad as opposed to fossil fuels are fine. We yeah. just need to we need to address the carbon. Right. Um, and then you know the you know uh, the world has has shifted you know dramatically uh, in in the, the last year or two and. Uh, um, people have woken up to the fact that uh, uh, energy energy can be weaponized, and um, you know there is real world consequential risks for for getting uh, uh, that kind of uh, balance uh, across policy goals uh, wrong. And so I just think that there's um, you know I don't think it's a a shift from one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, like I said, I, I truly believe that, um, you know, uh, decarbonization and uh, energy security can, you you can, uh, um, can do both. pursue them hand in glove. It's, it's not a yeah, poor choice. I think that I think in the war in Ukraine, though, did highlight this, that you know the desperate need for for energy because when Russia turns off the tap, and then when our allies, and I'm thinking particularly Germany, ask for energy for oil and gas, we can't or won't deliver because we haven't put in ourselves ourselves in a place where we can. We don't have the LNG terminals. We kind of won't on the other issues, and and that that's almost been an embarrassment or I think an issue for Canadians themselves who want to be able to help and want to be able to respond. And somehow politically we've put ourselves in a position where we can't. Well, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, I'm a self-defined pragmatist and I like to look for solutions. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the, there's a real opportunity to kind of set aside, you know, statements of the past or decisions of the past. And let's just start with a blank slate and, and do a policy reset with everything that we know now. Um, and again, we don't have to seed any one uh, policy objective. Decarbonization can be uh, uh, on equal footing with with energy uh, security and supply, uh, but I do think it does require a different a different mindset. You know, if if you know, just going back to the the U.S. IRA and and you know, uh, President Biden will be uh, visiting Canada. Um, in the coming weeks, you know, the, the fact that the the uh, the pivot the Biden administration has made in their view of energy secure security and their role in providing secure oil and gas to the world was was made exceptionally clear. And it, it should it should make Canada uh, stand up and note uh, take notice. Um, you know, the U.S. IRA was was already uh, um a landmark piece of legislation that has governments globally uh, really paying attention, going, "Oh, gee, how are we going to compete for that global investment capital and get all of the the that patient uh, large scale capital that's going to be required to to build those kind of decarbonization projects in their own countries?" And um, you know, we, you know, Canada has an opportunity to to rethink its current approach. Um, the, the clear difference is the U.S. is taking an incentive-based approach to attract investment uh, for these, these large-scale decarbonization projects, while Canada's approach is more prescriptive and regulatory focused. One is offering an all-you-can-eat buffet of carrots, and, and you know we have, for lack of a better term, uh, a buffet of sticks. So I, I really think there's an opportunity to kind of, um, you know, maybe maybe instead of trying to pretzel a pretzel, let's just sit down at the table with a blank piece of paper and go, okay, this is where we're at now. This is the competitive landscape for, for um, global investment capital. Uh, we have some of the best and brightest minds um, technologically on decarbonization technology here in Canada. Um, 
if you if if you're an investor or if, if you're uh, an energy company accountable to shareholders and you're looking to deploy capital you know canada has to has to be competitive and um and you know we too want to contribute to decarbonization we too want to make sure that we have domestic energy security and are contributing to north american uh, energy security we too want to have all of those uh, jobs and e- economic benefits of those large-scale uh, decarbonization projects happening here in Canada. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's uh, an opportunity for everybody to just go, okay, uh, blank slate. If we had okay. a do-over, how would we? What 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 policy uh, environment would would we uh, have to to create that? Do you think that there is a willingness to do that in Ottawa? I mean, we have seen. What's happened, as you say, with the buffet of carrots that the Americans have laid out, some $400 billion in subsidies to green yeah. tech, maybe even as high as eight. We do have some the bright, some of the brightest minds, but they also go where the money is and where the reward is. So unless we really change our thinking in this country, a lot of that talent and a lot of that tech development is going to be drawn south because there's going to be money to do it and you won't have to put up with bill 69 or people saying that oil and gas is bad i mean do you get the sense that there's any willingness to change the yeah i think i i'm uh i you know i've been in my role 10 months and i would say yeah. in 10 months uh not just domestically here in canada but but globally attitudes are are shifting you know that that climate change is a global problem that needs yep. that needs to be solved for but there's other things that we need to make sure we're we're uh keeping our eye on on the ball uh, in in the same way i also see a, a shift in terms of taking the blinders off on climate change um you know uh, one of uh, uh i forget who who said this um in Sarah week last week, which which is, you know, global emissions are indeed that they're global. Right. So right. we need to focus on the entire uh, denominator, not just our own uh, numerator. And so, you know, when I look at, you know, what uh, we, we talked about uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan in terms of uh, Canadian upstream energy producers, but they're also uh, offshore as well. Exactly. And, uh, you know, there's great opportunity um, uh, off the West Coast for uh, LNG and floating LNG. And, you know, why can't Canada be loud and proud about all of the really terrific um well, A, let's be loud and proud about the fact that, you know, as a member of uh, of the G7 who might not be uh, have the biggest economy and uh, right. uh, it, it isn't the biggest militarily, let's be loud and proud about the fact that we have the fourth largest energy reserves on the planet. And it's in a democratic country where our energy is responsibly produced. And we have we're we're bringing to bear uh, uh, GHG emissions reduction uh, technology to uh, to uh, make that even more responsibly produced. And if we export that, for example, to Asia and displace dirtier forms of of uh, energy like coal, uh, why can't we get credit for that? So I, I I think attitudes have started to shift, but there's there's more of an opportunity to to uh, to take a, a more holistic view uh, of of the issues and the benefits, and um, not just within our own borders in Canada, but uh, impact to the globe. What are the you've, as you say, just been in your job for uh, for less than a year, and I read about this stuff all the time, and so I, this is kind of a what what in the last 10 months has grabbed you the the developments that are going on in this sector, the carbon capture the hydrogen power, gray, blue, green, whatever it may be. Is there something that's grabbed you that you've just said, wow, if we actually really do this, we are going to be able to do both things at once and and have an impact on climate change, but also have our moment to be loud and proud about our energy sector? Like, is there some breakthrough development that you've seen that just you go, wow, that that could be the ticket? Um, I think the U.S. IRA 
and the follow on uplift program is yeah. probably that that component uh, in, in terms of uh, geopolitics, Russia, Ukraine and the mm -hmm. impact that has had on energy security and energy supply and uh, affordability and then uh, country specific responses to that, uh, the US IRA is an absolute, absolute game changer. And, you know, if, if you, you know, again, if you look at, at Canada, you know, the traditional approach in Canada has been what I call pancaking of legislation or, um, you know, a, a few, uh, a couple of carrots, but mostly, um, mostly sticks and it's uh i know i'm mix mixing food metaphors but you know if you look at the pancake of, yeah. of of legislation and regulation that's happening on top of our industry on itself and then if you also look at the pancaking of legislation and regulation impacting um uh, the flow of capital that is is allowed to come into our industry, uh, we are not seeing the forest through the trees. You know, we have the opportunity um, to be, you know, the U.S. is, is out to win. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it, I would just implore anybody to listen to uh, U.S. Secretary of Energy Granholm's speech. She's a member of the Biden administration, and they are out to win. They want... Uh, they want all of uh, they want all of the production and all of the investment capital into those large scale decarbonization projects, which, by the way, are a very critical piece of the energy transition uh, puzzle. They want it to be uh, in the USA. And, and she's like, and then we're going to put a made in the USA stamp on it and we're going to sell it to the world. Well, well, why aren't we doing that? You know, well, we, we have some of the best uh, the, the best uh, producers in, in Canada and we have some of the best uh, decarbonization technology in Canada. And yet uh, our 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 policy construct here federally and provincially is so complex. And and you know what? Maybe Canada can't compete dollar for dollar uh, with the, the uh, enormity of the incentives in the USRA. Yeah. But, you know, we can compete on making our uh, complex and Byzantine permitting process, um, you know, make it much more simple, make it more integrated, make it coordinated. And um, and we can we can uh, carve out a space for Canada to win uh, in this global uh, competition for investments capital, too. We do see the Amer the Americans have always been much more flexible. I mean, if, if Trump said, you know, America first, then when the Democrats are elected, they just change the wording a little bit. But, you know, they are prepared to do that. They are prepared to put America first. Uh, it doesn't matter the political stripe of the leader. They just call it a different thing. And as you say, quite aggressively going after uh, this part of the market, we seem to have a harder time um, changing things around. I mean, Bill 69 is still going through the courts. I think everybody even privately concedes that we've got way, way too much complicated regulation in this sector. But but it's it's it seems so difficult for our politicians to change their mind. Um, Again, even with the advocates of of climate change crisis, you know they've overpromised. Um, the pace and possibility of shutting out oil and gas is just not going to make it. So why not just pull back and say, you know, you're right. It's going to take us longer. But everybody still seems pretty entrenched in in their positions. I mean, recently we've got politicians lecturing us about, you know, we're going to have to give up our way of life. We're not going to you know, have all the air conditioning we want in, all, in the summer and all the heating we want in the winter, and we're going to have to sacrifice making this kind of a negative thing as opposed to uh, what could potentially be a rallying cry. Yeah. Well, you know, I, if I look back, uh, if I go back, you know, a decade uh, or more uh, when I was uh, on the investment side uh, mm -hmm. of my career, um, we were really excited um uh, about a decade ago about the LNG opportunity for Canada and um you know that should that is something that Canada should have absolutely owned end to end and you know it's it's been subsequently dubbed 
the lost decade. And the mm-hmm. U.S., uh, which was nowhere on uh, LNG uh, seven or eight years ago, is, is now uh, the world's leading exporter. And we have to, Canadians now have to uh, backfill most of our supply through the U.S. to, to and, and pay a premium to get it get it to market. And so, you know, there there's a lot um, that Canada do, can do to make strategic policy choices uh, to continue to grow our economy, to create prosperity for generations while contributing to the stabilization of energy, uh, global en- energy markets and um, uh, lowering GHG emissions. Um, but um, we really have to seize the moment because we are at we're at a moment in time where just like LNG, we should have owned that uh, mm-hmm. globally. We can own uh, things like carbon capture here in Canada, but it does require um, a policy reset. It does require uh, federal, provincial governments working collaboratively with industry um, to come up with strategic policy choices that um, pragmatically align environmental, energy security, and economic goals. And, you know, the U.S. Biden administration has just provided the blueprint, and yeah. maybe we can't compete with it dollar for dollar, but um, there are ways we can catch up and win together, or or we we very much risk being left behind. And, and I, I agree with uh, what uh, Granholm said in terms of balancing climate change and energy security. She goes, the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, I think Canada has the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time, too. Uh, it just requires um, um, everybody to kind of uh, really put their head above the parapet and see where the world truly is at um, today. Um, um, it, and to get us there. It begs this question because, of course, we're still talking about just transition or the transition of jobs is, again, which is all premised on the fact that people in the oil and gas sector are going to have to become something else, whether it's janitors in a building, said one memo, or coders, or it, should this not be, as you say, more in the American mindset, which it's not some transition of putting people out out of work. It's about following along with an industry that's in change in a state of transition in a positive way and contributing to that instead of saying, we're going to all, you know, we're going to throw you out of work. So we're going to give you a, a handout here. It's it's a mindset problem. Yeah, I, I definitely. If, if we, uh, if Canada can rise to the challenge, um, you know, we won't be needing, uh, we'll be needing more uh, energy jobs in Canada. And uh, particularly because uh, all of that terrific innovation and technology that the Canadian energy sector is undertaking uh, to reduce GHG emissions uh, is currently happening here. And, and hopefully it will stay here and grow here. And we will be the ones putting a made in Canada stamp on it and selling it to the world. And so, yeah, I think, um, I think that kind of thinking is very old school. It's, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's not um, reflective of where the industry is at today. The, the, the tremendous amount of uh, innovation that is happening in the industry uh, uh, because you know, you said it at the front end of, of this podcast, uh, all credible forecasts uh, say that uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for decades. Uh, and putting my old investment hat on, um, you know, the the upstream oil and gas industry is going to be a, a massive piece of the uh, energy transition puzzle, not because it's going to be transitioned out, but it is just transitioning to a new era. Um, I mean, rewind 30 years in the industry. There's a whole different set of technology that's, that's being used today than 30 or 50 years ago. We're just, we're just setting ourselves up for, for the next um, era of the industry. And um, the, uh, my members are are very much committed to um, 
contributing both to uh, decarbonization and to uh, energy security. And um, quite frankly, we have um, oil reserves larger than Russia. We have an economic and prolific light oil and natural gas plays that compete can compete with any country. And we have companies that operate with some of the highest environmental standards in the world uh, in a democratic country. So there's growing demand for responsibly produced oil and, uh, and gas. And we're one of the few stable democratic country that produces more energy than we consume. And uh, yeah, yeah. we have the, uh, we should have the willpower to get that to to our allies around the world. We could we could use a pipeline or two to get it even to other <laughs> a little egress would help for sure. <laughs> but you know, uh, again, you know, um, the IRA, the US IRA, is such a powerful, simple, yep. and direct uh, program. You know, if you c- capture carbon, you will get paid. And if you look at Canada at this moment in time, we have literally tens and tens of billions of dollars ready to be deployed. It just needs uh, regula- regulatory certainty and it needs to be dis- uh, de-risked in order to get to an, an final investment decision. And all of uh, all of those things have great benefits, not only in terms of reducing GHG emissions, but meaningfully increasing the uh, economic partnership with Indigenous communities. Um, and, you know, if I can cite, you know, Three, three of them, you know, the oil sands carbon capture uh, is a big one, uh, LNG phase two and others. So that means we really have to get that West Coast opportunity um, up and running and, and uh, bait and ord, you know, uh, off, uh, uh, off the East Coast. You know, that's that's also um, uh, a project of, of national significance. And yeah, sure. Canada really needs to... Uh, uh, urgently find a way to be competitive for global investment capital. And um, Canada should also be loud and proud and take credit for, uh, you know, what we are doing right. And uh, let's copy the Biden administration and uh, seek to win and put our own Made in Canada stamp on it and sell it to the world uh, for the benefit um, of Canadians and others. So seek to win would be a good Good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Seek to win and, and maybe rather than pretzeling a pretzel, why don't we just, yeah. you know, start over? It's like, how do we get there? As opposed yeah. to, you know, we said this, you know, two years ago when we did this. It's like that you know, bill how do we win it. today? And yeah. and yeah. that that I think requires a course okay. correction and, and maybe even a complete policy reset. I, I I don't every day, as you know, going to Ottawa, share your optimism, but I do <laughs> consider myself a pragmatist too. So I'm hoping that people can get back to the table and, and talk about what's really going on and leave all the rhetoric. Yeah, that's what we need. Let's just have uh, really yeah, uh, the thoughtful, yeah. constructive, solution-oriented yeah. conversations, federally, provincially, with industry. Yeah. We're all at the table. Uh, let's take it out of the the public domain and just let's just figure out yeah. uh, how, how, how Canada can win too. Get her done, as they say. Get her done, <laughs> as they say in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Good to meet you, Lisa. Really, you too. it was lovely to speak with you, and yeah. uh, I've been a huge fan for my entire life. So, oh, uh, well, it's been a, it's been a, you, a, it's a bit of an honor. So, uh, well, having grown up watching you every morning, so. Um, <laughs> You've got uh, a lot on your plate too. So now we're gonna now we're gonna, you know, turn that around. I'm gonna be watching you and and wish you all the best in this. Okay. Have a okay, great, great. Cheers. Lisa LeBaton. Lisa, president and CEO of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. We'll talk again soon. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense.